That's UBNRadio.com. Going behind the scenes with Hollywood's power players. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Reba. Starts now. Hi there. Welcome to Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. I'm Reba, in case you can't tell. Yep. Well, we're here on Tuesday afternoons. It's now 1 p.m. Pacific time on UBNRadio.com channel 1. And we're here every Tuesday, so thanks for coming back with us. Uh, we've got a very, very exciting day planned. Who are we talking to? Well, we're talking to probably one of the luckiest young women walking the streets of Hollywood Boulevard, Shelley Regner, who... Oh, my God, you've seen her in Pitch Perfect 1, and you've seen her in Pitch Perfect 2, and they just decided to green light 3. And then... Well, I, I would say it's more than luck. She obviously worked very hard and is prepared when the opportunity arose. Well, that's the second part of the okay. show. It's you can work as hard as you want, but if you don't have a great manager behind you pushing you, you might not make it. And we're going to talk to Joanne Horwitz, who took an unknown by the name of, let me see if I can remember. His I keep spacing it out. Kevin Spacey. There you go. Knew him for 14 years. Got goosebumps when he won his first Oscar. And now he has two. And then he was knighted. So, I mean, what more can a manager do for your career? Has an American ever been knighted before? One more. But don't ask me who because I forgot. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk... What are we talking about today? I think opportunity. Opportunity. If there was ever a word that describes Hollywood, it's opportunity. Everybody comes here looking for it. It is. And, you know, now more so than ever. I mean, for years now, we've had crowdfunding with like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And just last week, the laws changed where filmmakers can now actually not just ask for gifts, but they can actually sell shares to the common person. So instead of $2 million being given to Veronica Mars, Hundreds of thousands of people could have owned Veronica Mars and been a part of the excitement, not only of seeing it get made, but also seeing the excitement of it succeed. Wait a minute. And do they get any money? What? Who well, wants the, excitement? I know. You want excitement when you don't live in L.A. You know, you think you're part of the movie business. Don't they get their money back? I mean, I well, wouldn't invest. In, in, no, in the old way, it's like they got a very expensive DVD, maybe signed if they paid a lot of money. And if they truly were willing to, willing to part with, like, several months' salary, they might have been able to have lunch with someone special. But now they actually, if the film is successful, they actually do get their money back and then some. So now they get to be a oh. part of the business, too. Oh, if you get your money back now, that's interesting. But let's talk about not getting your money back. Somebody just got arrested. Yeah. 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 He kept the $122,000 that he made from a Kickstarter campaign to do a board game that never got made. Well, I, But the cops I, yeah. arrested him. Did but they? I don't know what they're going to charge him with. They, you know, because this stuff is all new. It is. I'm sure it's going to be interesting. Same way as, like, I think people are going to quickly discover that most films don't make their money back. No kidding. And so it's going to become some interesting times, and perhaps uh, maybe gifting is a better way to go for, at least in the independent world. I have was never gifted. Do you know that? Ever. Yeah. I wasn't either. I mean, most of the rest of the world has government funding that supports the creation of art, so they don't worry about it being commercially viable. So w th there's opportunity and there's unique, very changing times going on here. And it's going to be fun to see, but, uh, you know, kind of t tailing back to it, I think that these new opportunities, it's an equal opportunity for men, women, old, young, anybody who wants to go out there and have a great story that they want to share. Well, that probably will help women directors because they're having the hardest time in the industry, and we're going to probably do more of that in depth, but I have a feeling these Kickstarter campaigns are definitely going to open it up. But I did a little research, and there's one called Junction. Okay. And it actually has Tom Hanks attached to it. Wow. Which, which could be good as an opportunity, but it also, I have to say, on the devil's advocate side, if the studio is not willing to back Tom Hanks, is there a reason? You're asking me? I only interviewed him six times. How would I know? Well, you interviewed <laughs> him six times. That's, uh, yeah, but he, has oh, anybody <laughs> interviewed him more than that? Oh, I'm Maybe sure. Jay Leno. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I didn't have a, my own show. But listen, these are the names I found besides Kickstarter. I found Junction. I found Indigo. I don't even know what these Indi things Indiegogo. Oh, Seed and Spark. Okay. They're, they're kind of a unique, uh, you know, kind of cross in the middle of that uh, crowdfunding and distribution. And then there's Slated, which is kind of a social network that's putting together financiers and filmmakers. Okay. But, but, there, but there's a the whole... Best. Well, there's a whole new realm coming up, but I'd say right now, 
Speaking of opportunity and great women, let's, let's talk to Shelley. Break can happen anywhere. And for our guest today, Shelley Regner, it happened at LSU when she auditioned for an, a movie that no one had ever heard of called Pitch Perfect. I, you I've heard of it. Well, now you have, but I'm going to ask her. When you did that first audition, because I know how many times you were called back, but you'll tell me, <laughs> what was going through your head, and did you have butterflies? And were, just tell me everything. It was a lot of unknown, you know. It was, it was really exciting. Um, and, yeah, it was at my alma mater. I had just graduated four months prior uh, to this audition that, you know, I knew they, they wanted a musical, you know, song and they wanted us to sing our favorite karaoke song and I auditioned with about 70 people I knew probably about half of them because we all were students at LSU it was an open call and so I figured open call means open to anybody even alumni so I'm gonna go why not and uh, you know it was just like any audition I, I have a theater degree and so it was just kind of going going back to those roots of walking in a room and meeting a new person and uh, but yeah, they, it always gives you that rush and that a, a adrenaline and excitement. But I was going to ask you, there's a difference between rush and excitement. What about nerves and, and, and butterflies and how scared were you? Or with all that training f from LSU? It is a reminder that you want to do a good job and you want to put your best foot forward. So um, I was a little bit nervous, not scared, um, I wouldn't think. But yeah, nerves were definitely there. So let me ask you this. I'm sure you're going to remember the song that you sang. Do you remember that song? Absolutely. I can remember. I remember what I wore. I was in a maroon dress with um, my black pumps. And I went in, and the casting director said, OK, we asked you to sing your favorite karaoke song. What are you going to sing for us today? And when I told her the song, her eyes got so wide because I was taking on a legend. Uh, and I told her I was going to sing I Want to Dance with Somebody by Whitney Houston. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> when I interviewed Whitney Houston, uh -huh. she gave us permission to use in the video profile that I did with her, I Want to Dance with Somebody. And did we had to get permission actually from ASCAT and the writer, from every single person. But it was her choice that we show this. So I'm going to just tell you, I think you have a guardian angel in Whitney Houston. Oh, wow. <laughs> so how many times do they call you back? It must have been a great rendition the first time. They called me back uh, about three times. I sang that initially. I uh, went back for the director, who at the time uh, was man, Jason Moore. And, uh, and then I went back for the producers. And, um, you know, they had us dance. They had us do group numbers as well. Um, so it was about three times we got the call back. And then on a Friday night, I got the call that I booked this role. Her name's Ashley. They want her to be in this girl group. And rehearsal starts Monday, and I got the cast list on Sunday night and with a, a list of nine other girls, and I had no idea what I was in for. I didn't realize the caliber, you know, that we were about to, you know, that we were in for and, and this incredible journey that has now become, you know, the pitch perfect that everyone knows today. What, what, what was it like going down, being on the theater path and then having this opportunity present itself, which took you in a completely different completely I, 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 different actually to the opposite direction coast. the uh, absolute opposite coast than I was even aiming for um, yeah I grew up in musical theater you know I started in the fifth grade doing school musicals the Wizard of Oz and Hello Dolly and as the little chorus girl and so my sights were always set on Broadway and uh, but being in in a musical film uh, it has all the aspects of being, you know, and it's summer musical theater camp. You know, I'm with friends, uh, with new colleagues. I get to sing and dance. The only difference is there's a camera right in front of my face doing it. Um, so it was definitely, it was, it was a little bit of an adjustment, you know, uh, when you have something this close, you know, for a close-up shot. But the best part about it was that we still got to perform in front of live audiences. You know, we had, uh, for the first movie, our biggest audience was about 700 people come and watch our finale number. And for the second one, uh, this go round, we had 3,000 people coming from all over the world to come see our finale number. Where did you shoot the, this? Did you actually go to Europe? To, I mean, it was set in Europe for those. <laughs> we, we brought Europe to Baton Rouge, Louisiana and New Orleans. <laughs> so we made that look like Copenhagen. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You shot 
In your hometown? In my hometown. I grew up, I was born and raised, I went to school in Baton Rouge, and that's where we filmed. We filmed on LSU's campus, so I was the tour guide of the first and second movie. I was I was the go-to girl of, where do you need to go for dinner? Where can I go grab a coffee and, and a book? Where can we go out and karaoke, or, you know? And, and, when, and was your friends and family in the audience when you got to do they those were live there. performances? My parents were extras for the first movie, and they were just as wide-eyed as could be. They were so proud. My dad, you know, is he's a businessman, uh, full force. He's a numbers guy. He he can appreciate the arts, but that's definitely not his forte. And he was looking at all these cranes and these cameras and this equipment and was just wowed by the amount of people it takes to put on, you know, one day of production. Um, so I was really excited that I got to share it with them. Okay. We've now had the real story. Now let's get to the <laughs> truth. Okay. They say that women, you won't understand this, don't work well together. Oh. And I want you, Shelley, to tell us what really happened. The gritty on that stuff, set. right? Yes. When the claws came out and the blood, sweat, and tears. You know, it's funny, especially this movie. It's definitely, obviously, a huge female ensemble. There's ten girls all at once. There's obviously got to be cat fights and and high tension and divas on set. The best part, the the producers and directors, they know what they're doing. They know how to pick the girls. I'm telling you, it was summer camp. It was a slumber party every night on set. It, everyone got along so well. Everyone was an incredible worker. You know, I, I, for me, you know, and the first one especially, it was my first film that I ever did. So I was there being very observant, learning from these experienced camera actors and and from the behind the scenes aspect too um so you know a lot of the girls anna camp rebel wilson they took me under their wing you know and gave me this advice um anna kendrick i just i aspire to have a career like hers you know she's just her career's blossomed in the last three years and so it's really it's a great learning opportunity but um yeah you know i i think we, we we would get exhausted, I think, more towards our choreographer because he knew how to push us, and uh, and we were all dancing in, in heels. So we, we whined and complained a lot that our feet were hurting. <laughs> how different was the second film because you had a woman director? You had the wonderful Elizabeth Banks, who I only interviewed. I never thought actresses were going to turn around and deliver she's, such great. She's incredible. I can't say enough wonderful things about Elizabeth. And it was really exciting to have this full force female driven sequel coming out you know our writer Kay Cannon she's a female and and everyone's always like oh women don't know how to write comedy women don't know how to be funny and I I think it's incredible that we can give you know Judd Apatow and all these these male driven comedies which I love to okay. death but a run for their money you know well, that, Bridesmaids that, was pretty good and Bri was Bridesmaids you know it had a little bit of success I think yeah uh, I've heard of it once or twice um, but Elizabeth it, it was it was her feature film debut directing debut so she you know I feel that she may have had a little bit of pressure put on her because all eyes were kind of on her one as a first-time director two as a female and she passed with flying colors for me I mean she was the driving force of this movie she she was the energy she was the ringleader uh, you know she she was a caretaker and and a support system all in one and she got another film already to direct that, which I thought was a step which was applause exactly I was, oh I was so excited I sent an email to her and you know I've sent so many I'm indebted to so many people with this movie as, as a jump start to this career that I've always dreamed and aspired uh, don't to worry. have the, the, the They'll, they'll, they'll remind you of that as you get bigger. <laughs> yeah. You remember that time? <laughs> yep, exactly. No, they, they, they won't forget. Yeah. But, but with that now, it's like because of the success in Hollywood, all of a sudden now it's actually coming full circle and you're getting interest back in New York for yes. a while. Yeah, I just actually talked to my agent today, and uh, they said they're looking for maybe some Wicked uh, replacements, and which is one of my all-time favorite musicals. And uh, you know, I saw it for the first time eight years ago, and I know I want to be the green one. And uh, <laughs> which means you've got some pipes. Like, that's, not, that's not an easy role. Uh, look, I, I took on Whitney's "I Want to Dance with Somebody," and, and, and I, I booked a job on it. So hopefully, you know, it's it's taken me and it's going to lead me somewhere. But uh, yeah, I definitely. I have more of a soulful sound, and uh, that's what the casting director said. She she was shocked when these pipes kind of came flowing out of my mouth. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed. You know, I would love, I would 
I think the the dream for many actors and singers is to you know be bi coastal and be able to go back and forth. So if there's an opportunity on the on the East Coast, I would love to take it. Well, one of the things that fascinated me in reading your credits or how many jobs you seem to keep working like like Karen Knightley who when I interviewed her she said she got into acting so she could take an acting sabbatical and hasn't stopped working but she's pregnant now so she has to stop working she's earned it definitely you haven't stopped working that's the I I love that fact I would rather be busy than not doing anything I'm I'm definitely I like to keep busy I like to constantly be doing something and I like to be creative and I you know, I'm a people person I'm from the south you know so I love working with people I love getting to know new people and uh, and being able to create story stories or sing songs and just be original is really exciting to me so hey if I get to keep working and just take a sabbatical when I become married and pregnant way down the line <laughs> I'll take it well it was one thing to work in ba Baton, do I say it right? Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. Yeah. Okay. You don't have an accent, so it's hard. <laughs> She's using her American accent right yeah, now. Yeah, the, the standard American. <laughs> but you're out here in LA, so I'm wondering what advice your mother gave you now that you're in the wicked city of <laughs> Hollywood. My mom, as she would call herself, my momager, uh, she is my biggest support system and my number one fan. She's um. She has given me so much advice over the years. The, the main thing that I always take with me that she just constantly says is, uh, birds of a feather flock together. So uh, it's, I, I think it's really important to have a, a great core group of support out here, um, you know, really to kind of keep you grounded um, and, and humble yourself. You know, you can't, the, the amount of success that you may or may not have, you can't let things take you into you know this non-realistic world that uh, you know you got to stay grounded you got to have good people behind you that you can just go take your shoes off be in your sweatpants and watch a good movie with <laughs> let me ask you a question and and this is really a woman's question did I or feel, do I feel so biased I'm sorry do <laughs> We don't have. We only have two You're minutes. You're discriminating left. against me. I am. No, I, no. I wanted, we, you can you can be involved in this one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to know if you've learned to play the Hollywood game. I don't think guys have to play it as much as women do. The Hollywood game. Oh my goodness. I don't even know. Well, I might. I might Hollywood be in game. it. Like, but, like I'm indie. I don't even know what the Hollywood game is. Yeah. I the maybe Hollywood I'm game still too is green that you have, to know what the <laughs> Hollywood game is. You have to know who to talk to, who not to talk to, what behavior you have to have. You know, Hollywood is high school with money. It is. And it it's is. filled with mean girls who are just dying to get Shelly and embarrass her or push her out. And, and I wondered, how much is instinct what you're doing and how much is it that you really pay attention to what goes on around you. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm definitely aware that there's there's a game and people, you know, people are constantly trying to get to their next goal or the next project, whatever that is. But also something that my mother taught me and as well as my father and, and a lot of advice that I've heard from multiple people, you got to be nice to everybody. You know, I think it's it's... It takes too much energy to try and and plan or manipulate or, or be a fake person. I just like to show up in a room and have a glass of wine and, and get to know the person that I'm talking to. And, you know, I like to laugh and I like to smile and I like to give that to other people. And I feel like that's, you know, a calling that I have. So if we can share that together, great. And if you want to be mean to me... Go for it. I'd rather just drink wine in the other room. Well, <laughs> well actually, you know, we're gonna, I, I think we have to wrap up. But with have, that, you know what? Shelly's making a great, great point. We're going to drink Which to is you. that <laughs> the key to the Hollywood game is that conundrum fixes all conundrums. That's it. <laughs> thank you, conundrum. No. Thank you. And, and if you really want to make an impression, put it in the Barkeep Silver Lake glasses. Oh, but, God, I love you. <laughs> thank you. Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. Drink it slightly chilled, perfect for summer. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com Again, that's WagnerFamilyOfWine.com. Find your wine, find your adventure. 
Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. Barkeeper in Silver Lake has the finest cocktail shakers and vintage glassware and barware from the mid-century to new. And let's not forget about Barkeeper's unique spirits, 150 different kinds of bitters, and their unique gifts. In fact, Barkeeper provided a lot of the vintage barware for Mad Men. BarkeeperSilverLake.com. Don't wait to visit their store or their website at BarkeeperSilverLake.com. It's your very own Barkeeper catalog for unique gifts. with Hollywood's Power Players. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Starts now. Okay, I want to go back to the early days when you were a kid. You said you started performing at She's four. She's in her 20s. That's not that long no, no, ago. No, 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 no. But <laughs> four is a lot. What did you start singing at four? You know what's funny? I was actually a terribly shy kid. People don't believe me when I say this, and I'm glad I, I grew out of my little turtle shell. Uh, but I, I started actually in dance. My mom t put me in tap class, and that's that was my first, uh, you know, live stage experience. Um, but then, yeah, having to sing, I would always sing, you know, at the Christmas concerts in my living room for for the family with my older sister. But she usually took center stage because she liked the spotlight, and I would I would be there as the backup singer or playing, you know, the fake keyboard by the the chimney or something. This is like <laughs> a Disney fireplace. movie of like the little girl doing the backup Can you imagine singer who it? really was the star. Yeah, and you know what's funny? My first trip out here to L.A., I was 12 years old. Still, you know, fairly fairly timid, but I was very observant. And uh, we went to, it was my mom, my sister, and myself, and I'm the youngest, and we went to a taping of The Family Feud. <laughs> and the, the host, uh, the, the commercial host, Asked the audience if anyone would like to win a t-shirt. <laughs> well, I guess I really wanted a t-shirt very badly. So I raised my hand. He said, do you have any special talents? What are you going to do? So I get up in front of this audience of about 200 people or so. And I said, I'm going to sing. And when, if there's one thing you need to know about me, it is that I am a Beyonce fanatic. She, I, She's my muse. I love her music. I've loved her since the Destiny's Child days. And I told, I told the host that I was going to sing Survivor by Destiny's Child. So, and I so you take on all the easy songs. Uh, all the easy songs, yes. I'm a very, All the soulful ones, definitely. So here I am, this little 12-year-old shy girl. My mother and my sister are about to fall out of their chairs. The fact that I'm in front of everyone speaking in a microphone. They put my face up on the monitor, and the whole audience is clapping, and I'm there, I'm a survivor, singing this song just to win a T-shirt. And I think from that point on, I realized, you know what, you know, I, I could maybe do this. And and the audience was smiling, so maybe maybe I have okay. a, a shot. I I have to tell you, I, I'm dying. I'm sitting here dying. Isn't it hilarious? <laughs> no, <laughs> when I because you you interviewed Destiny's Child also. No, I oh. interviewed Diane Keaton, and that was her story. Is that she was little, or she was a little younger than that, and somebody asked if, if somebody would come up on stage and perform. Yeah. And she did it. She, you, I don't think a lot of people know that Diane Keaton is a really terrific singer. And I had no idea. If you see the film Looking for Mr. Goodbar, she does sing okay. really well. And I'm listening to your story, and I realize there is a thread that happens with people who potentially become stars. It's, it's there, Shelley. You are just like people who came before you. Then there's another part. 
Okay. <laughs> You're the younger sister. Sister, older sister was the star. Mm -hmm. Now, what does she honestly feel about you now? The queen of Pitch Perfect <laughs> 1, 2, and soon 3. Tanya well, Harding and Nancy Kerrigan. Yeah. <laughs> You know, of course, she's as proud as yeah. can be and, and will always support me. But we've always had that little sibling rivalry there. And, yeah, my sister's a very, very talented, you know, woman. She, she's actually the dancer of the family. I will give her that one. I can dance, but she's got the technique for it. But is she in Hollywood? No, no. She's in she's in the other L.A. So I, I'll take on this L.A. Okay. and she'll be down south in that L.A. Uh, holding down the hometown fort. And, and, and I've got to ask, like, it, there's a big difference difference between like doing a, a live show where you sing and you go straight through it yeah. and, and actually singing and dancing on a movie where you may have to do take after take after oh, take. Oh yeah. There's a well, lot of sweat that goes into that. <laughs> well and, and also I mean even for your own voice like I mean were you singing full out every single time? Or? Well that that's the the best part about doing film is we got to pre-record okay. so uh, we we recorded the soundtrack first and then they would play it back as we would do the big musical numbers so luckily we could save our voices but on on more of the intimate shots we would actually sing okay. with the recording we would have to do that over and over. So thankfully, we had we have wonderful PAs and and crew on the set that they always had water on hand for us. Um, so it's very important to stay hydrated, is what I learned. <laughs> well, you know, Sonny, in Pitch Perfect Two, which was different than one for the sense of, that the competition not only was it harder, but that it was meaner. It was really mean. Oh yeah. They, they had some cutthroat lines and choreography. And the, the biggest thing for us the second time around, as you saw in the first movie, the girl group only had one number up until the final performance. And this one, you know, we had to be the best of the best. So we had a different number for each scene, and we had to make it better than the next. And so it was, you know, we would go home. Our, I felt like, you know, like an old lady, my back was hurting, my feet were hurting, you know, I need somebody to ice things down. So, um, so what does number three have in store? Oh, my goodness. I can't even imagine. I hope we don't have to do, like, acrobatics or something. <laughs> It's got, it's got we, to go to we're probably level. gonna have to learn some type of new talent and skill. They threw props in the ring this round. You know, I had to hula hoop for this one. There well, were, there was fire. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, was it pink this last year at the Grammys that like hung from the ceiling and spun? Or oh who, my who goodness, was, she's she, she's actually set to be my stunt double for the third one. So <laughs> okay. you know, already been in talks with Pink. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what to say. I American mean, Ninja Warrior meets Pitch Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? But They're going to do the chorus while singing. Yeah. but here, I'm going to come back with like a 12-pack of abs. You won't even recognize me. <laughs> but here it is. She got thrown into Hollywood, and she's still here, and she's still smiling. And the only difference is she doesn't talk like she comes from Louisiana. <laughs> I try it? to hide it. Was Once, it. Get me around my mom and my sister long enough, and you, it definitely comes, it comes out. Back. It definitely. Yeah. It's old habits die hard. But <laughs> so you've had a taste a taste. A little taste. Yes, of what it's like. It tastes good, too. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> what does it do to you? Does it push you to want more? Does it... I don't get the feeling you would rest on your laurels. I really get the feeling that you're out there, so you don't mind, even though you have two big movies behind you, auditioning, or do you? No, not at all. I think auditioning is... It, is is a muscle in itself uh you know it, it really keeps you on your toes and and just like we were talking about earlier about the the nerves and the adrenaline it's um auditioning is it's a technique and and it's also a way to meet new people you know there are auditions and th like we were talking about you know previously that everyone's constantly making their own career you've got you've constantly got new actors you've got new casting directors new directors somebody that's new to meet and how do you do that? You go to auditions. Do, it, now, with, now with you, with your success, when you go on auditions, are you treated differently yeah. than it was when you were a complete unknown? I, I can tell there might be a little difference just because people know the project, and uh, so rather than walking into a room and not knowing your name and and knowing you know kind of what you can do people have a little a little taste shall we say of of you know my previous work um I, but and do the other actors in the room when they see you walk in the door just look down and say shit they all leave <laughs> clearly no <laughs> like that's got to no, be a little bit no. intimidating <laughs> uh you know it's funny i i don't 
I think I'd like to keep it this way. I feel like I I almost have a little blinders uh, on me of I, I don't consider myself, you know, like a, a celebrity or a star. You know, I'm just I, I'm me and I want to continue working and I want to do a good job and, and tell stories. And and you never I mean, you know, people come from the ground up and it, it's just that telltale story of it's everyone's got to start from somewhere. Well, it's it's what in the interview you did with Jack Lemon, he said as an actor, I would rather be respected than liked. And it seems Amen. like you have respect. I would hope so. I think they you know, like you I too, but, but respect. You have to give respect to get respect. But she has something else. She's a brunette in Hollywood. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, my and God. And I have never dyed my hair. Well, but this you're still too young. I mean, wait. Color. Wait till you get this age and you have to decide which way to make the gray work. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is the brunette has become the big... Actors that they're not big in size, but what they're look. I have to be very careful because I, w I was accused in my book of fat shaming. Oh. <laughs> so I'm very careful how I speak. <laughs> but the idea is that we always talked about the Hollywood starlets were always blonde, mm -hmm. and, and here the brunettes are really taken over. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's kind of nice when you walk into a room. Absolutely. How many brunettes are there when you walk in? To There's audition? a lot, you know. But it, it but it's interesting how many natural brunettes are there is is the fun game to play. You mean to say there's not a natural? <laughs> I didn't, uh, didn't know you, that. Didn't you ever hear of the bottle brunette? No. I mean, the bottle blonde had the cap the, on everything for years and right? years. Right, the platinum, platinum well, hair. You know what? We thank you for coming and sharing a little bit more of you. I, I got to tell you, Shelly, Shelly Regner, watch that name because I got to tell you, you give me goosebumps. I'm, you must think I'm nuts because I got it with Ed Asner. He's 85. She's a baby. But uh, I know <laughs> that we just had the opportunity to interview a star. Reba, I'm taking you to all the shows that I can take there you, you go. to. You got, to you, my you darling, got, Shelley. You Great success. Thank you so much. <laughs> Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. Drink it slightly chilled, perfect for summer. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine, find your adventure. Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. Barkeeper in Silver Lake has the finest cocktail shakers and vintage glassware and barware from the mid-century to new. And let's not forget about Barkeeper's unique spirits, 150 different kinds of bitters, and their unique gifts. In fact, Barkeeper provided a lot of the vintage barware for Mad Men. BarkeeperSilverLake.com. Don't wait to visit their store or their website at BarkeeperSilverLake.com. It's your very own Barkeeper catalog for unique gifts. with Hollywood's Power Players. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Ben and Reba. Starts now. Well, we've been talking about Hollywood. Well, you know, Hollywood is, the f is filled with success stories. And I bet people are surprised when they hear about overnight successes and they don't realize that it comes from hard work and a great manager. 
what a surprise. And boy, do we have a great manager here, Joanne Horowitz, who was just honored as the Talent Manager of the Year. You got Pat McQueenie's award, the award in her name. And I have to tell you something. I knew, I knew her because I did so many interviews with Harrison Ford that she called up and wanted to talk to me. Oh, my God. Is that fantastic? So when I heard that you got this award, I, I felt like we were related. Oh. We were like sisters. But here's the question, and it's probably... No, you both me, have a similar smile. The question is, yeah. what did it feel like to get the award? And then I want to ask some really personal things. Absolutely. 100%. Well, thank you very much. And uh, the Pat McQueenie Award was very special to me, too, because when I started off in the business, she was the only manager in the business back then. You know, she was like one of maybe, there were maybe five managers in the business then. And I always like looked up to her, like how does she do her business? You know, she had had Harrison for a long time already. You know she had her up until the time she passed away, uh, which was 40 years at that point that she had Harrison. And, uh, but he was her only client. And she read every script and answered every email and she was just very proactive. You know, my opinion is that if you have too many clients, then you, you can't possibly uh, keep track of everything, all the different aspects of their career and get back to people and follow through and all those such things. So for years, Kevin Spacey was my only, man, uh, my only client. And then uh, as time went on, because he, you know, Kevin loves to do theater and live theater. And so, you know, it's mostly non for profit. And, and uh, also when he was away, I wanted to keep busy. So I decided to develop a few new people well, this is kind of interesting. I mean, I've been around Hollywood for a few years. I understand actors that want to act or sing and dance. Mm -hmm. And no, writers have to write. And directors get this passion to direct. But how the hell do you know you're going to be a manager? <laughs> what a <laughs> weird job. That's like being a mother. <laughs> oh, yes, it, it definitely is. They are your children, and I consider them my children. But, uh, you know, when I started out in the business, I started off in publicity, PR, PR and marketing. When I was at MGM UA years ago, I was vice president in publicity and marketing. But before that, this is the best story. I Come was on. at Studio 54. <laughs> so I, uh, I was, a, you know, a little secretary at Universal Pictures and publicity. And the girl on my left was there 20 years. And the girl on my right was there 20 year, 25 years. And I was like, I'm not going anywhere fast here. But <laughs> uh, I went on a, uh, quickly on a date one night with a guy to a place in Queens called the Enchanted Gardens. And... Uh, he worked for Steve Rebell and Ian Schrager. We were going out dancing after work that night. So we ended up going to a few clubs, and they said, hey, we're opening a club in the city in about six weeks, Studio 54. They take me to take a look. And I said, listen, I work at Universal. I get celebrity bulletins. Uh, why don't you send me a stack of like 200 invitations? I'll send them out. And back then, People who didn't have alias names, they you knew, so you knew that Sylvester Stallone was at the Sherry Neville and Hotel, and you knew and, and we were working on a film with Michael Jackson back then too. So I just directly sent the invitations and had my number at the bottom, and they all called me and I got them in and and then after the opening, Ian said, "Why don't you come work for us?" So I stayed at Universal for six months because of the celebrity bulletin. I didn't have to pay for it, and then moved mm -hmm. on to studio. But I think you better explain, because I didn't know about the Celebrity Bulletin, what that really meant. It told you what? It told you what the stars were in town, what the dates they were in town, and where they were staying. And so back then, it was a more innocent time. So like I said, Warren Beatty would be at the Carlisle Hotel, and Sylvester Stallone was always at the Sherry Neville Inn, and it would say the dates. You could call them up and get them on the phone directly, which, in fact, I did you know, get them on the phone directly. I remember talking to Warren Beatty a couple of times. Excuse and, me, yeah. where did the balls come from? Uh, you know, I don't know. It still staggers me that I was so ambitious and so focused at such a young age. You know, I just had that drive. Do don't understand. Do you still have it? Abs it more than ever. You more can, than I ever. I can hear it in your voice. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, I'm as, as determined and as focused as I've ever been and as, you know, and as competitive as I've ever been. No, I can tell you walk into a room and you command a presence. Oh, well, thank, well, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. She is intimidating. I, I only met her in well, parties. I, I, I don't think she, I wouldn't intimidating. say intimidating. Um, no, I don't think she's intimidating I'm at a, all. But I think, you're not I, a woman. No, I think she's a presence. Like she walks in and I want to straighten up tall and go have a conversation. <laughs> and you want to be 
discovered? No, I, I, I want to well, be a part know, of whatever it is that she's doing. The night that I got that Pat McQueenie Award, which I had li- initially, when they called me up, said, uh, no thanks, because I, I appreciated it, but I'm, I don't really like being on stage, and I don't really like talking about myself. So the idea of getting up and giving a speech was horrifying to me. Uh, but then my girlfriends were, Joanne, you're accepting this award. You are entitled to have the attention be on you. You deserve it. And I called them back and said I would accept and, it. And, and what did you end up saying as part of your I speech? actually uh, was impressed with myself. I, uh, I had like a three, four-minute speech that I worked on. So it was perfect timing. The person before me spoke for 25 minutes. Whoa. And the person <laughs> after me spoke for 45. So <laughs> from what I understand, I had the best speech of the night. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you know, um, and I'm happy I got to say it, and I'm happy I accepted the award, and it felt good because Pat McQueenie, I always uh, looked up to Pat McQueenie. She I, was the ideal. She was a hell of a lady. I yeah. have to admit that. And Harrison just, he told me privately that he wouldn't have had that career without what she did That's for him. really nice to hear because I, I do believe that on a large scale. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, it's hard to find loyalty in the business. <laughs> But you right, you gotta be kidding. Yeah, but right. even at your level, I. Well, yeah. I thought it was at my level. But you know, you think about it. I mean, you know, you you know, you push down doors and you knock down doors when people are nobodies and no one wants to listen. And if you're, you know, tenacious and persistent, and you get them to listen, you know, I, there's a lot of stories going into that. But yeah, yeah, right place, right time. I mean, you know. So well, let's talk in, in a more interesting way. Yeah. I want to know what kind of perks do you get as a manager? None. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. You get to be, look, I know another manager t- who's initially, sorry, to the MG, premiere. I'm not saying names. Well, I don't know if that's even as a manager now. I think that I've, I've been doing what I've been doing, you know, over 20 years, over 25 years now. And honestly, when I was at Studio 54, that was the networking mecca of the world. And a lot of the people I know from them, from then, back then, are still, you know, forces of nature. Like, you know, all the people at Clear Channel started off at MT- MTV, hadn't even started yet, type of thing. So I had a lot of music contacts back then. And th- those contacts are mine based on my experience, not based on my clients. So do they get to make you, like, we know that Kevin Spacey is a major, major star. So does it make it easier for you to manage a major, major star as opposed to the young and lucky you. <laughs> I have to say his <laughs> name, you. Scott. He's what, oh my God, I love looking at him. Thank you. Especially if, when he takes his sh- when shirt he takes off. His I, I couldn't get the word off. <laughs> so everything, everything's still working just fine. It's <laughs> so funny. I mean, I've had Scott for nine years and that's what people don't realize too. All of a sudden he looks like he's an overnight success. But I okay. literally found him sitting on a couch 10 years ago and he was, I think, maybe... 16 or 17 at the time he wasn't living in LA he just happened to be here for a couple of days and I gave him my card and three years three years later he had saved that card and called me up when he moved to LA and I put him in class and he was green when I started with him but he was always gorgeous Is he was tr- always gorgeous uh, no, and what, 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 I knew that he, he had that presence like his daddy has that disarming presence he's just powerful when he enters the room and I just thought there was something there if he was serious and focused and uh and it's not always that i mean that's a that's not something i don't get that feeling very often to take someone literally from sitting on a couch i mean there's a lot of famous uh children in hollywood they don't all make it and get to the point where scott is right now and i actually didn't want scott in his dad's movies i wanted him not to be in his dad's movie i wanted him to make it on his own and did he listen to you yes he did I have to say Scott listens really good, you know? Did Kevin listen to you? Because to me, he comes across really demanding, but maybe that's his persona. Well, Kevin's, uh, you know, super intelligent. I, you know, I I don't want to really call him a genius, but he is. Um, I think, you know, definitely in the beginning, you know, I mean, he, you know, his confidence is also based on, on the success and where his career is at, you know, and Kevin always has had a, you know, a very, like when he went to do the old Vic Theater, he said, he manifested what he was going to do at that theater before he even did it. 
and everything turned out to happen. So when the Queen... Which is extraordinary. He manifested exactly how it turned out. And when the Queen knighted him, did you go to London? We... He hasn't actually gotten the award yet. Are you going? I don't... We don't even know what the date is, so... Okay, well, skip it. Are you going to go? I... You know, (laughs) I hope so, but I don't know yet. I mean, you know, he started season four, House of Cards. So, you know, he's got a very busy schedule. So it'll be sometime, you know, probably Christmas time or early in the year. Well, that's great. I think, unfortunately, we're out of This time, is killing me. Oh, no. I know. Yeah, we're going to have to come. You have to come well, back. I have to come back. You have a minute. Okay. Wait. Can you really take someone totally unknown and turn them into a star? No, unless you, I, I believe you have to really believe it. I mean, I, it was in my vein. You know, Kevin was in my vein. Scott Eastwood was in my vein. The the three or four other clients that I have are at the moment in my vein. I like to think that I'm that discerning, that if I'm going to pick somebody, I'm not interested in the mid-range actor. I'm interested in the ones that I believe will be movie stars, you know, go the distance. And, you know, I mean, and not inherit somebody who's already there. I mean, to take it. And mold it. So I really believe what I have right now. Yeah. We'll I get ha- there. I well, ha- well, we have to have Joanne come back and you talk about some other work. Back. I want to come back. Yeah. I feel so bad. It's Are we okay. on air? Are we on well, air? We're, right we're, we're still we're, on air. We're, but no. here's okay. the thing. No, we're, we're on air, but I'm, I'm excited because I'm actually, Reba won't be able to be there with me, but I'll be on location at the Festival del Sol in Napa Valley where I'll get to see Kevin oh, perform he's, at the he's gallery. He's performing. He's singing. He's singing. Yep. He's singing. You know, you know, we did a movie years ago called yeah. Bobby Darren. Mm-hmm. I saw it. Right. I loved it. Beyond the Sea. You don't have to tell me. I love that movie. It will definitely stand. It yep. definitely stands the test of time. Oh, everybody's so excited up there. I mean, that that event sold out like in seconds of announcing that Kevin was going to be headlining. Oh my God, he's good. He's yeah. really good. You know, and he plays a mean harmonica too. Oh, okay. Well, I we'll, have we'll one thing to say uh-huh. about having you today. I have one regret in my career that I didn't have a manager like you. I could have been a big star. I just realized that. Yes. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I really, you know, I do believe that, you know, there is that that focus and that push and that, you know, you close that door, me, I'm opening that door. And, you know, and and we didn't really have enough time today to tell, you know, to tell you about my but elephant we're going to get you back yes. immediately. Yes, immediately. <laughs> immediately. And, yeah. I am so glad well, you showed up. Uh, you can follow Joanne on Twitter, Instagram, and as Facebook. You can follow Shelly Regner at, at Shelly Regner, R-E-G-N-E-R, on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, please support uh, Wagner Family Wines Conundrum, Barkeeper Silver Lake, and you can watch repeats of this great show and tune in with us on UBNRadio.com, on iTunes, on YouTube.com, Reba Merrill, oh my God, I have and FilmFestivalFlix.com, Real Hollywood Live. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Ben and Reba.